merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that the Lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, Comforter, Keeper, Spirit, we long to Good morning and welcome to the services of the Benton Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here and we ask that you hang around at the close of worship in order that we may get a chance to know you better. Also at this time, we ask that you fill out an attendance card. The red side is for our visitors and pass those to the inside aisles. Uh, this morning, we have come together to worship our God and to remember his son Jesus. And before Scott leads our next song, I want to read a passage from Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31, for it says, If God is for us, who can be against us? God did not spare his own son, but he gave Jesus up for us all. How, he, how will he not also, along with Jesus, gracious, graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against any of those whom God has chosen? No one. It is God who justifies us. Who then is the one who condemns us? No one. Christ Jesus died. More than that, he was risen from the dead and is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us.
Would you bow me, please? Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, praying that we can be molded by uh, our service to you today and by the lesson presented to us and by the songs that we sing and the, and the lyrics that we take into our minds and to our hearts, Father. We have a, a long prayer list and several that are in need. Right now, Father, we uh, want to lift up to you at this time, especially Steve Folks, and we ask for continued prayers for him. We're thankful that uh, <coughs> Philip Rudd was able to come home without uh, too many complications. We were thankful for all the prayers that you have answered, and uh, we want to remind ourselves to be thankful of those while we ask for continued prayers for others. Uh, we're mindful of Bob and Ann York as they struggle with their respiratory issues. We're uh, mindful of Pamela Ross, who is coming off of surgery. Uh, we pray for Brenda Woodward and uh, several others uh, that are in need. Doris Harper, who has uh, broken some ribs. And there are several others. We thank you for the members here and for the elders and for the deacons and for Mark Ray uh, in his recent marriage, Father. We ask for safe travels for him. We're thankful for Nathan Pirtle. We ask that we would be attentive to the lesson today, and we're thankful that you brought him to us and what he's helped do with this youth program. Um, Father, we're thankful for his family, and at this time, we are uh, want to be reminded of how richly blessed we are to be a part of this congregation. May we seek opportunities not to not to just conform to the Sunday and Wednesday services, but there are several other opportunities out there through the other five days of the week to serve you and to do good not only in this community or in other communities, but especially in here in Benton. Uh, we, we pray that our worship this morning would be in spirit and in truth to your will, that we would pay attention and that we would take all worldly things out of our hearts and out of our minds and, and replace it with wholesomeness and with, with, with a spiritual with a spiritual mind. And it's your name we pray. Amen. This morning I would like us to concentrate on this act of communion as we prepare to 
share the Lord. It was actually very coincidental that we sung that hymn just now because that was the, uh, the thrust of my thoughts this morning concerning the communion that we share as we come together to share in the Lord. And those thoughts are echoed by Paul in his first epistle to the Corinthians as he is teaching them to not repeat the sins of Israel and to not fall into the pitfalls of the idolatry, idolic practices of the Gentiles, but instead to devote ourselves to Christ and to the sharing of Christ one with another. He writes in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, free from idolatry, I speak as to wise men, Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Let us think about how God has united us to him through Christ, and we are united one to another in Christ as we participate in this feast each first day of the week. If the men would join me at the table. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time giving thanks for your Son, Jesus. Dear Lord, we thank you for his willingness to leave the splendor of heaven, to come to this earth, to walk as a man, to do so in sinless fashion, dear God, and in perfect obedience to your will to lay down his life on that cross of Calvary. At this time, we remember his sacrifice. We remember the atonement of sins. We remember his body that was hung upon that tree, dear God. And we unite together in him in this feast as we partake of this bread that represents his body. Please bless us and forgive us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
Let us give thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we come at this time giving thanks for the blood of Christ that was shed on Calvary's cross. Dear God, in an act of perfect love manifested through his sacrifice, we understand that this blood is the only substance so holy and so powerful as to wash away our sins once and for all. Help us to understand as we partake of this blood, of this cup, that it represents Christ's blood, and that we share in him, and that we share one with another. Help us to do this in a worthy manner. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Having concluded the Lord's Supper, we find this a convenient time to give back to support the work of the church. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings you continually extend to us. We thank you for the spiritual blessings we find in Christ. We thank you for the physical and material blessings that you use to provide for our needs. Help us to understand that all these things flow from you, dear God, and that they are for your disposal. And help us to give back to further the work of your kingdom here with a cheerful spirit. Thank you so much for loving us and caring for us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
scripture reading for this morning is from James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. You can be seated. Good morning. morning. I'm thankful you're here, and uh, I appreciate you took the opportunity to worship with the Benton Church of Christ, especially if you are a visitor this morning. We most welcome you. Uh, If you haven't noticed already, I am not the the preacher here. Now, I have a microphone that says preacher on it, and I almost turned it back in because I'm not the the main preacher. Uh, If you haven't heard already, uh, Mark has recently gotten married, and he is on his honeymoon, therefore... You are stuck with me this morning. Now, we do miss Mark, and you may think that even more after this morning's lesson, but I appreciate you being here nonetheless, and we're looking forward. I, I guess the shower is tonight. Is that, is that right? And so we have uh, the gym set up for a shower, and uh, we're looking forward to that time of fellowship and, and honoring uh, this recent marriage between Mark and Rhonda. And... Uh, here's the thing, I'm actually gaining a, uh, a new member of the youth group as well because Rhonda has a son who will be in the youth group age and so we're looking forward to having him uh, and her as well worship with us and become a part of our family but uh, also as the youth minister here I'm excited that we're going to gain a new youth group uh, member as well. Now, we also, I want to uh, let everyone know that uh, Uh, Pamela Ross, after her surgery, she is home. She was able to go home yesterday, and she is uh, dealing with some extreme pain and and, uh, whatnot. They had to repair some nerves in her shoulder that were cutting circulation off or feeling to her arm. And so uh, that was a very serious surgery, and uh, she has quite a bit of a scar uh, from her neck to her shoulder. Uh, But uh, the doctors say that everything went well with that surgery. And she is at home recovering now. And she says she's fine with visitors. So uh, if you uh, would like to visit her or pay her a visit, you're more than welcome to do so, according to her. Also, Mason Cosner has surgery on June the 25th to repair the uh, fistula in his artery. So uh, be thinking about those young people as they deal with different uh, medical procedures and, and, uh, and the, the upcoming surgery. Uh, and also uh, be mindful of the young man who had the car wreck as he is still recovering as well. And so we, uh, we want to go to God in prayer uh, on, on behalf of our young people who are dealing with different things. So let's, let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you so much that we can come to you on behalf of uh, sickness, illness, surgeries, uh, difficult moments. We're so grateful that we get to come to you and, and have the assurance of knowing that you take care of us, Father. Uh, we ask that you be with Pamela as she recovers from her surgery, and we pray that you would just help her as she, uh, she deals with the pain and she deals with the, the uh, rehab of getting back to uh, a, a normal life, Father. We pray that you would help her to be patient as she recovers and help her to, to uh, recover to her normal self before she... Uh, goes to college, Father. We pray that you also will be with Mason as he is uh, planning to have surgery. We, we pray that you be with the doctors and pray that you would just take care, care of him as he is uh, uh, going to enter into a very serious surgery. We pray that you just help, uh, help uh, Krista to, to be uh, to be trusting in you and, and know that uh, you're going to Take care of him, Father. We pray that you just uh, bless us today. Pray that you be with the young man who's had a car wreck as he is still recovering as well. Be with us today as we look at your word and as we, we uh, learn a lesson from your word today. Be with Mark as he travels. Thank you for the opportunity today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this past week you may uh, have heard that we, we took a group of young people to inner city Chattanooga. Chattanooga is about four hours away, which, you know, is relatively close. It's not a bad trip there. It's 24, uh, 24 all the way. Let's see if this thing's on. No. That's 
I'm on now. There we go. Uh, you know, so it was an easy trip there. Uh, but the things that we did, we took uh, about nine young people and we had about four adults. Uh, and the things that we did, we did inner city uh, work, but we, we uh, helped update the inner city church building. Uh, we were painting, we were repairing things. Uh, we, we worked at a homeless shelter. Uh, we, we worked with a, a program called Man of Mondays, which the Red Bank Church of Christ uh, does for every Monday for the community there, for anyone that needs a meal. Uh, we went into the apartment complexes, uh, the projects of Chattanooga, and uh, we had some amazing times playing with the children, singing songs, uh, vacation Bible school style songs, uh, and, and uh, teaching them about God and about Jesus. Uh, and we also went door knocking around the inner city uh, church uh, building there. And so we took a, a group of nine young people, and you may be thinking, well, that's a relatively small group. But I can tell you that the nine that we took worked as hard as any group that I've ever taken on a mission trip. You would be proud of our young people and the devotion that they had to serving other people. Uh, the adults that we had go, we had Linda Janice and Miss Mary Rowe, and then we had one college student. Zach Martin uh, participated in this trip as well. And so uh, we could not have asked for a better trip. We had a, somewhat of a hiccup when we get there. We were going to originally join a work camp and uh, participate in that area's work camp. When we get there, there was forecasted, uh, there had been forecasted some storms and rain, and they had decided to cancel that work camp. Now, pretty much the only explanation I have is God came in and he took care of everything else because everything else just fell in line and we were serving and working and reaching the community every single day. And so it was a phenomenal trip. I appreciate your prayers and I appreciate those who took the time to, to go on that trip. Now, on to our lesson. James chapter 2 is where... Our scripture reading was today. And basically what I'm going to do is, this is a very basic elementary lesson. Because this book right here, I just want to talk a minute about how powerful this book is. This book, to me, is one of the greatest evidences that we have that God exists. Because whenever you consider the unity of this book, and you consider uh, the fact that this book was written by 40, over 40 men, over a time span of 1,600 years, across at least two different continents, uh, and, and you see the, the different men that were involved, you see that, that uh, they came from a variety of backgrounds. Nehemiah was a royal butler. Uh, you had Peter uh, was a fisherman. Luke was a, a physician. Matthew was a tax collector. Solomon was a king. Uh, Moses was a shepherd, David was a shepherd, Paul a tent maker, and you see these men wrote from almost every human condition or aspect that you could basically even get today. They came from different walks of life, they chose different careers, different, different ways uh, of living. But then you look at the unity of the Scriptures, and you see that these 40 plus men in three different languages somehow managed to put together... This, over 1,600 years, in unity and in sync, and all of it comes together, and all of it makes sense, and all of it has the same message, to me, that is very, very powerful. Because there's no natural explanation as to how something could come together by so many different men over such a length of time and still be unified in its message. The only explanation is that we have a God that came or that, that decided to work through these men to put together this powerful, powerful book. Now, when we get to James chapter 1 and verse 22, the NIV of this passage reads... Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Now, if you're reading New King James, you may read, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. But today, I'm going to talk about this passage in particular in the order that the NIV has it. 
Do not merely listen to the Word. The first thing that I want to talk about this morning is we ought to listen to God's Word. In other words, we need to spend more time in His Word. We need to look at this Word as something that we cherish and something that we respect and something that we feel the need to get our instruction and direction in this life from. Our guidance, our knowledge, our wisdom from this book. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3 as He's being tempted by Satan after fasting in the wilderness for 40 days. And He quotes Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3 and He says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, even when Jesus was being tempted in a weak moment, He compares the Word of God and He says, Listen, The Word of God is more important than feeding ourselves. In in a way, the Word of God is what what allows us to stand firm and resist the devil. Now, he compares the Word of God to food because at that moment, that's what he was lacking. And at the moment, that's what Satan was tempting him with. And he compares. And so God's Word compares the... Or, or God compares His Word to several different things. You'll see a sword. You'll see a body armor where it's compared to. But for a moment, I just want to, to see this parallel to our spiritual lives and God's Word and this parallel to, to eating and making sure that our bodies are healthy, making sure that we are strong physically as we are spiritually. Because you see... If you and I make the choice to neglect the opportunity to listen and to be in His Word, what eventually happens is malnutrition. We become weak. We become individuals who are malnourished. And see, this could take place when we decide not to feed ourselves. We become malnourished and we become malnourished spiritually. It's easy to become malnourished spiritually when we fail to feed ourselves on God's Word. Now, there's some symptoms that come about whenever we are a malnourished individual. One of those symptoms is we become listless. In other words, we don't seem fired up about anything. We don't seem like we have the energy to come to worship or to study His Word or to grow in our relationship with God. You might think of a handshake. Have you ever shook someone's hand and you just didn't have a lot of life in it. You know, you, you, sometimes you compare it to a dead fish. You grab someone's hand and it's just flopping. That would be the idea of a listless hand shape. Something that doesn't seem to have a lot of life in it. And see, one of the symptoms of not feeding ourselves spiritually and, and being in God's Word is we become malnourished, but we have that attitude, that listless attitude. How many times do we see individuals today, teenagers even, that seem like they aren't really fired up about God? They aren't fired up about the opportunity to serve. They aren't fired up about the opportunity to spend time with their brothers and sisters in Christ or to spend time with church or to participate in church activities. They aren't fired up about their relationship with God. And we spend a lot of time really scratching our heads wondering, well... What can we do to help this individual? They just don't seem like they have a lot of life. They don't seem like they're fired up about their relationship with God. We need to, we need to, you know, get them involved with something. Maybe they need to uh, uh, have a visit from a friend, or maybe they need to, you know, to go to camp, or maybe they need to go to this or that, or or whatever we could come up with that's other than feeding them God's word. We see individuals all over. They're starving, and we want to help them. And we try to restore someone back to strength and good health, spiritual health, by resorting to everything but spiritual food. Everything but God's Word. Now, we've got to stop fooling ourselves. And we've got to put the power back where it belongs. Because nothing takes the place of food, and allowing our bodies to be healthy just as nothing takes the place of God's Word in our life. Now, 1 Peter also uses uh, an example of food here. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 and 2, 
There's some things that we ought to take away or remove from our lives. There's some things that we need to get out of our lives. He starts off in verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. See, there's some things that we have to get out of our lives in order for growth to take place. There's some things that we need to remove And we just saw that list there in verse 1. But you also see where the growth takes place. Where does that growth come from? Notice the word desire. The pure milk of the Word as an infant desires milk. Now, I don't really have a lot of experience in this situation, but I'm told that A crying baby, you know, when you try to, uh, you give them something other than what they want, you try to give them something other than the milk that they want or need, you try to pacify them, you try to distract them with a toy, you try to figure out some way to keep their mind off of milk because maybe you don't have it at the time or something, and it doesn't work, does it? When you try to give a baby something other than what they want to eat, it doesn't work when they're hungry, does it? And the baby will cry out. And and see, the Lord says there's some things that you need to get out of your life. And and, and there's some growing that needs to take place. And there's one thing that will do it. It's not a visit from a friend. It's not attending a a youth rally or a youth trip. Or it's, it's not getting involved in some sort of ministry, although those are good things and beneficial things. It's when we desire the Word of God like a baby desires milk. In other words, the yearning is so strong that there will not be relief from the crying until that need is met or Malnutrition sets in with that languished, that listless attitude. And unfortunately, I'm told that babies eventually, once they do not get fed, they will stop crying. This morning, I want you to ask yourself, are you really desiring the pure milk of the Word? Are you crying out for it? Is your desire to read His Word and to be strong and to be on fire for God. Are you still crying? Are you eventually just got to the point where you just don't cry anymore? The other symptom that we see of malnutrition from not growing from His Word is that we have a low resistance or a poor immunity. Malnutrition people have a weak immune system. And they they seem to to contract any common illness. They seem to get any common illness because their immunity is, is not where it needs to be. You see, spiritual health parallels our ability to resist Satan and temptation. You take a typical high school teenager. Well, they just won't come to church. Or they do come to church, but they curse, they gossip, they bully, they indulge in whatever, they go to parties, they do this. They come here, but they they live this lifestyle. They don't have any integrity. What's wrong with individuals who go out and have a life or live a life other than the Christian life that they are called to live? It's their immunity is not where it needs to be. They do not have the ability to withstand Satan and his temptations because their immunity is low. Just as Jesus, when He was being tempted by Satan, He continued to spit out Scripture after Scripture and use that as His strength against Satan. Again, we say we need a visit or some, some way to plug them in or, or, or go to a camp or retreat. What's really going to give someone strength? It's when we decide to spend 
our time in this Word. What gives you the strength when you're tempted by Satan? What gave Jesus the strength to withstand the devil? It's His Word. What helps you to overcome the things that you're struggling with? It's God and His Word. Now, the second thing that we want to talk about that's a part of James chapter 1 and verse 22, it says we listen to the Word, but number two, we do what it says. Now, when's the last time that you heard a lesson or you read His Word and you made a determination afterwards that you needed to work on something? Maybe you read a scripture, maybe you read something and and you just thought, man, I have got to work in that area. I've got to do better in that area. Or maybe you've read God's Word because you're struggling in that certain area and you just went to His Word because that's what you needed the most at that time. Today I encourage you to roll up your sleeves because this is probably of the two things that James talks about, one of the most challenging things. Because we usually don't have a problem, you know, coming to worship, to to listening to the sermon, or in Bible class, listening to our Bible classes, but we see that our greatest challenge normally is doing what it says. Today I want you to be willing to accept the challenge of doing God's Word. The challenge that we seem to face... Sometimes it it isn't listening. It's doing His Word. Now, Romans 10 and verse 17 says that our faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You see, we establish a greater faith because of this, because of God's Word. We grow because of that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But then you get to James chapter 2. You get to James chapter 2 and verse 17 and it says, Faith without works is dead. In other words... The faith that you have acquired from reading, if you do not do anything with your faith, you do not, James says, have works, and we're fixing to look at that, then your faith technically does not exist because it's dead. Now we can sit and listen and read, but until we live it, we really don't have faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, now that we understand what faith is, Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, For without faith it is impossible to please God. And we ask the question, well, uh, do we have faith? Do we have true faith this morning? Do we have living faith? Now, Now hold up. Because there seems to be some sort of contradiction in between James and what James is teaching and what Paul teaches, right? And we we probably have heard or or seen this contradiction before or what many people will consider a contradiction because you get to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and it says you are saved by grace, not by works lest any man should boast. Now hold up. Is there a contradiction between James 2 and Hebrew, uh, Ephesians 2 and, and James chapter 2? Now, I will say no. Because what are they both teaching? They are both teaching Jesus. Hebrew, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is teaching Jesus because he's telling the church at Ephesus... There is no other way to get to heaven except through Jesus. You're saved by grace. Grace is an unmerited or undeserving gift. It's the price that's paid, the debt that you owe for the sin that you carry. Now, how was that price paid? It was paid by the grace of God. That salvation is offered because of Jesus Christ. You can't get to heaven unless you have Jesus. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, those works, those works that are mentioned there, are the works of the old law. It's not, you get to James chapter 2 and you'll see that those works that are mentioned in James chapter 2 are different works. Now, you get to James chapter 2, James is teaching Jesus. Paul is teaching Jesus because Jesus said in John 14 verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father except through me. 
There's Paul. He's teaching Jesus. James is teaching Jesus. You get to James chapter 2. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? And then you skip down to 18. It says, I will show you my faith by my works. They're both teaching Jesus. James says you can't be like Christ unless you care for people like Jesus did. You cannot be like Christ unless you love people like Jesus did. James is teaching Jesus. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We see where Jesus teaches what we ought to do. You see, James brought up taking care of people, didn't he? Matthew chapter 25. You see where Jesus teaches what it means to be his sheep. And it says in verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Jesus is talking about taking care of people. And not only that, but he's talking about the day of judgment. And he's saying there's going to be a separation. And the people that are on The right. The sheep will be to the right. And the goats will be to the left. And James says you 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 faith is demonstrated by your works, your care for other people. You taking care of other people in need. Jesus says on the day of judgment there will be a separation between the goats and the sheep, and the sheep are the ones that take care of the needy. You know, we talk a lot about our talents and our gifts and our abilities. But when Jesus talks about the sheep, He says this is for everyone. This isn't a matter of talents or or, or gifts. We often talk about using our our talents and our gifts for the kingdom. But but church, we've got to start thinking outward. This is a matter of salvation, Jesus says. You can't be pleasing to God with no faith. You cannot be on the right hand of God unless you become the sheep. You see, the Word of God builds us up, but when we do what the Word said, it builds others up. And that's what it's all about. Today, do you desire to have a more intimate relationship with God? Maybe you have that desire. or Maybe uh, through His Word you have allowed a kindle to become a flame? Do you desire to see God more in your life and in others' lives? Do you desire a passion to see this world change and turn to God? Do you want to live as as a strong and faithful Christian that is demonstrating living faith with your life? Today's lesson is very simple. You listen to His Word and you do what it says. You be in His Word, and you do what His Word says. Today, I want to encourage you, if you haven't been the sheep, if you haven't been as strong as you ought to be, if you haven't had living faith, that you come now as we stand and we sing.
Nathan, we appreciate that great me message you brought to us this morning. We need to be reminded periodically from time to time that we need to continue being strong in the faith. And there's more to it than just coming to worship service. We need to act on his word and incorporate that into our lives every day. Thank you again. <coughs> We have several we need to remember in our closing prayer. Uh, Bob and Ann York have been out for quite a while due to some uh, respiratory issues. Bob is doing better and he hopes to be back with us tonight, but Ann is still struggling with the respiratory issues as well as high blood pressure. Uh, Brenda Woodard, the mother of Beth Farley, had surgery at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville this past week. She is doing well, but will be in the hospital a few more days. Her address is on the bulletin board. Steve Falks continues to be in critical condition but is stable and he's in the ICU unit of the Jewish Hospital in Louisville. Karen uh, is with us this morning and we need to continue to uh, remember Steve and Karen and the family in our prayers. Uh, Philip Rudd uh, had a stent put in and he is with us this morning. Uh, Pamela Ross, uh, Nathan already mentioned, we need to continue to remember her in our prayers. Mabel Keith had cataract surgery. She is able to be with us this morning. And we need to also continue to remember Mason Cosner and his upcoming surgery. Would you bow with me? Our most righteous God in heaven, we thank you that we can come together as your children and that we have a time that we can lift up those before you that we, we want to bring uh, to your, to, up to you uh, and ask that you would help them. Dear God, continue to be with Ann York. Help her to get better so that she can be back with us and thank you that Bob is doing better. Continue to be with Brenda Woodard and help her to uh, recover soon. Be with Steve Folks, dear father, and continue to uh, give him strength and uh, help a heart donor to be found for him and continue to watch over him and Karen during this time. Thank you that Philip Rudd is able to be back with us and that we have modern medicine that can, can do such wonders. Uh, thank you that Mabel Keith is with us this morning and continue to be with her as she recovers from her cataract surgery. And continue to watch over Pamela Ross as she continues to heal and be with Mason Cosner in his upcoming surgery. Dear Father, we thank you for Nathan Pirtle. We thank you for the good work he does with our youth, and we ask that you'd help him as he helps them to draw closer to you. And dear God, as Nathan has spoke to us this morning, help us to not... Just be here as your word, but help us to roll up our sleeves and be about the business of being doers of your word and implementing it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have a card of thanks from the Florence Robertson family that says, Dear Benton Church of Christ, thank you so much for the meal provided for us. It was a special time to be with our family. We appreciate all of the many cards, calls, visits, thoughts, and especially the prayers for our mother during her many times of sickness over the years. We also want to thank you for taking communion to her each week. She missed going to church and being with all of you, and this ministry meant so much to her, and it did to us too. She is where she has wanted to be for some time, praise God. Sincerely, the Florence Robertson family. Uh, in the way of announcements, we have a wedding reception for Mark and Rhonda tonight after services in the gym. A lot of women have put a lot of work into doing this and there will be some cleanup to be done afterwards. So I encourage you to, uh, if you've not been involved in the prep, to be involved in the cleanup afterwards. Uh, June 18th, the Red Cross will be at our building holding the blood drive uh, from 12.30 to 5.30. There is always a need for blood, so please consider helping this life-saving cause. Um, uh, as we're dismissed, we have Bible classes for all ages. And we invite you to stay for one of those. And we also invite you back at our 6 p.m. services tonight, as well as our 6.30 services on Wednesday. If there's nothing else, we're dismissed. <laughs>